So welcome everyone to this uh, first webinar in a series of webinars that we will hold this um, spring, April and May. Um, this is the first one and it's about handling supply chains and uh, about business opportunities uh, uh, in the health markets in China and Southeast Asia. The other ones will be focusing solely on, uh, on China. Uh, and the next one is the 20th of uh, April, and then we will have an introduction or a, an overview, an update of the the market um, by Business Sweden in Beijing, but starting with a presentation about the Chinese economy and well, political situation in China in general uh, by the National uh, Competence Center on China, the Swedish uh, center. So, um, but today our focus is both China and Southeast Asia, and it's a, a lot about uh, supply chains uh, and, as I said, business opportunities in this uh, large market. And uh, our first speaker, or both our speakers, are from um, the company Asia Perspective. Um, and the first one is Yuan Nen, is the head of the Beijing office. And then we will have Manwen uh, Xiong from uh, the Stockholm office. So Yuan, I think I will just uh, leave the, the screen and the talk time to you. Well, thank you, Anna. Great pleasure to be here. So I'm Yuan Nell and based in Beijing, where I lead the Asia Perspective office here. So I'm pleased to today, together with Manwen, speak about overall China and what we see and what we see particularly in supply chain and in opportunities here. So I've been working with China for the past 10 years or so and started out learning Chinese and now since 2019 I'm based in Beijing. Yeah. So if we start just to give the overall picture of what has happened in the world these past 20 years it's really important to remember that it's been a huge change in uh, the whole gravity of where things are happening from an economic point of view in the world. Just there in year 2000, you still had North America and Europe being the great majority of the world economy, and that is no longer the case. We have had China that has gone up over 10 times in size of its economy, together with large parts of Asia also growing and really catching up a lot to be huge markets that keep on growing at a bigger growth rate. So much of this has already happened, will happen even more that Asia is becoming dominant as the consuming market and for some categories as well uh, uh, in the supply side. Um, just to give some more on the size of things. It used to be that China was a quite small economy relative to the more developed, such as Japan. And that is what has really turned around these past 20 years, that China is now often about half at least of the Asian market in, in China alone. And we also have Southeast Asia that is becoming increasingly important and increasingly mature, both from a consumer perspective with high growth across many economies and also significantly lower costs and uh, ability to deliver despite that, giving a lot of competition for China on the supply chain. And going back to whole world, what is of course happening is we have overall aging in the developed world and a country like China is stepping into this phase of its development that already labor force is becoming more educated and more demanding in many ways and also becoming older and smaller. So that China has, a, from having had a lot of help from demography, China is shifting to having challenges in its demography and uh, uh, being even more pushed to reach higher efficiency and, of course, also take care of more people. Um, then we have what we can see for the long run, like Africa having a very different population pyramid, 
and much of developing Asia being somewhere in between, but with some countries already starting to cross over uh, to come into more aging phase where they no longer have a you know, demographic dividend. So um, if we check out some of uh, the markets where they are, so Thailand is already there with uh, about similar age structure like China and will really get a lot more challenges now over the coming years, looking out to 2030. Uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, considerably younger, but also coming in uh, to the same development as you see in the rest of the world, though at a slower, uh, slower scale. Now, I'll focus mostly on talking about China and uh, the overall environment there. So uh, there's been quite a lot of reform the past few years. Uh, much that has been less visible as so much focus in reporting on China has been on uh, uh, the trade war and then of course on uh, COVID. But overall, China has been doing quite a lot on uh, uh, the financial sector always having the biggest worry of uh, the government has for long periods been and also for uh, large companies to have a financial crisis. So this is to avoid that, it really worked to uh, have less leverage in the real estate sector and uh, overall in the lending, uh, which hopefully makes the economy more stable, but also makes it hard for some companies to grow as it is hard to get uh, uh, get financing for growth. Uh, China has also uh, got tougher environmental laws and uh, more enforcement on that, which of course overall is a good thing, but may uh, catch some companies by surprise. For example, that you have suppliers or suppliers suppliers who suddenly cannot operate because it's discovered that they have been doing something that they weren't actually allowed to do. And uh, now that is being enforced. Uh, we also have changes such as the foreign investment law, where China overall aims to clarify uh, on the system and what benefits you can give to foreign investors and uh, to be more equal to uh, Chinese investors and also to reduce differences between what the different provinces and cities can offer. So you have this overall with uh, China in some ways becoming more mature and also opening up to encourage investments. Then, of course, you have a lot of challenges for the foreign investors that we'll come back to later. But there is more areas of the economy that are open. You have new players coming in, for example, in finance and also automotive and some industry and healthcare, of course, where higher demands and regulations changing so that you really need to uh, analyze company by company uh, whether it's getting harder or um, or easier. Uh, we also have cyber security being a big regulatory shift where China has announced several new laws really quite rapidly over the past one, two years for a lot of that being purposes that we are doing in Europe as well, such as personal information protection and higher cyber security, um, but which is also a challenge for companies to uh, comply with. And you have the overall trend on uh, protectionism when it comes to data, um, making it much more important across all industries dealing with data. Uh, speaking on data, there is also social credit system that has been uh, written a bit about, mostly from a personal perspective, but we're actually uh, the bigger trend that has actually happened and is already implemented is that there is now a lot more central and public data available about companies and those you do business with, uh, which makes it easier and more transparent, but also, of course, very important to uh, make sure to understand that, particularly if you have own operations in China, so that yeah, now it will be visible to your business partners if you are uh, getting administrative penalties, for example, uh, or uh, 
uh, yeah, don't pay taxes on time and so on. Uh, things that we kind of have in Europe as well, but that China is now putting into these huge systems. Then uh, talking about overall challenges for China, the aging population is of course uh, a challenge and that generally needs to uh, get richer and uh, to be able to support its population that is aging and that is to a great extent still uh, quite poor, even though uh, part of the population is at a uh, high living standard. And overall, the industrial competitiveness uh, as the population is getting older, labor force smaller and salaries going up uh, quite a lot. Uh, that is really a challenge where China needs to automate and work overall on productivity. And then lots of the environmental problems are still there, although it's a high priority to do something about that, including carbon and including that which affects your daily living environment, such as pollution. And this is all in the context of a country that is very, very unequal, both within the cities and even more when looking at different regions, comparing the prosperous mega cities on the east coast to inner regions that have very, very much lower GDP and development levels. And then a challenging relationship with much of the rest of the world with trade war and overall the trading relationships, how they are going to develop. And uh, on the logistics sides, we'll get back more on that. Lots of disruptions. Also, everywhere around the world, cross-border data is a more sensitive topic. And uh, that affects, of course, the business of China with the rest of the world. And then trying to keep together the standards where it's overall China is still, in our opinion, striving to be part of uh, global standards and to shape standards, for example, around telecommunication and in many areas being very active in shaping those standards. But there is also a risk constantly of that uh, drifting apart uh, and a situation that nobody really wants, but may end up in still. Uh, um, overarching on this is a business environment that has overall become more politicized which of course adds complexity to a business when it's less predictable and you may get policy swings that really affect business very heavily, such as we had uh, edu online education companies, for example, last year that was really surprising even to many here with good insight, just how an entire industry uh, more or less disappeared or was reduced greatly pretty much overnight due to policy shifts there. So lots of risks, um, but then also lots of opportunity with growing part of population that can afford uh, uh, more high quality solutions and overall a drive towards sustainability and healthier lifestyles and things that Scandinavia overall is very strong on. And the increased compliance and transparency overall, there is still plenty of uh, plenty of issues but on the improving trajectory and that can strengthen the competitiveness of the Scandinavian companies. Then we also have very strong in 5G connectivity, China aiming to take global lead and we're strong on that and just need to make sure to adapt and be part of those ecosystems when selling solutions that are built on connectivity and uh, really uh, making sure we are on top of, of that when China is pouring a lot of resource in connecting more and more uh, such as transportation and manufacturing and healthcare as well. Uh, um, going back more on data, it's uh, really everyone knows this is something that is growing at a high rate in the amount of data being produced and the amount of really large companies where the primary value is data. We also have a strong development in connectivity where um, China is getting a lot more 5G base stations and has for periods really been uh, dominating in the entire world in 
the speed of uh, of rollout and china also has pretty clear policies and getting more and more specific in how to regulate the data so you're getting industry specific regulations at really high granularity of uh, this is sensitive data this is not sensitive data and this has just started to come really last year for example automotive industry certain kinds of maps are sensitive at this and that resolution and these things you start to treat uh, uh, data as a factor of production and include it in economic policy where we really see where that ends up but it's a sector that is being re-regulated in a fast way and very important to follow for any company that touches a lot of data in devices or also just in dealing with customers. So um, ICT, it's really quite the jump there. 5G, already high user penetration, something where China pushed on, particularly during COVID, because of necessity to have better connectivity and also as part of overall stimulus, shifting from building old infrastructure like bridges and rails to uh, working more with uh, uh, new infrastructure where 5G base stations was part of that and orders went out to uh, telecom companies to accelerate implementation. Also data centers and uh, um, healthcare facilities also being part of uh, a push for new and smarter infrastructure and the ambition to really be a cyber superpower and having industrial internet and using uh, the new abilities of the 5G technology, something where we can expect China to have a continued high focus. Um, and on the data, it's uh, famously lots of uh, restrictiveness. There is a, a global trend on countries regulating cross-border data more. And for some purposes that can be, uh, can't really argue with them, but you uh, of course need to take into account the cost of compliance. And here China has these three laws that uh, have particularly big impact and where you see new guidelines on interpretation being released at quite a high pace. Uh, and this is something that really impacts some companies who uh, have a lot of data produced in China, who may need to have a lot more local servers and uh, also really uh, have to review, are we compliant or not? And where does that take us to become fully compliant with the laws in China? So that was a bit on the uh, overall landscape of China. Now getting into more supply chain, I go through a few things of uh, the challenges that it's mostly about on uh, the supply side. I think one of the most dramatic that has impacted a lot of uh, Scandinavian companies across industries is the um, entire situation on uh, semiconductors where it was really an unforeseen consequence at the start of the pandemic and throughout that people wanted a lot more electronics. You were using it at home and ordering huge volumes of electronics globally. And then you had industries such as automotive, for example, that did not, that canceled their orders and then got to the back of the queue. So um, quite a lot happening on the demand side there in 2020 and then also shocks on the supply side some of that being the cause of the pandemic with workers not coming to the factories and so on and the difficulties on logistics also fires in some foundries of semiconductors and other unfortunate circumstances that really made it into a kind of perfect storm of everything that was not supposed to happen on semiconductor supply chains happening at the same time. And then you got a lot of panic buying and also quite a bit of speculation 
from traders buying up inventories. So we are now in a situation that has been throughout 2021 where the lead times are almost twice as long as they would normally be to get semiconductors. And often companies are not able to get these through the official distributors, but have to turn to more brokers and alternative sources. And of course, that means quite a bit of problems uh, practically to uh, ensure that you don't get ripped off and so that you secure the quality and so that you, you have to pay on the new terms and so on. So um, a situation that unfortunately seems to go on and may very well last the full year uh, that we have uh, really a challenge where many companies end up having to delay some deliveries or give less features or have to redesign so that use a different kind of semiconductors to those that aren't good in supply. Um, then on the overall uh, uh, exports and supply chain, we see challenges in particularly getting things out from, uh, from China, which is very much due to that uh, exports jumped so much just in uh, dollar terms. It's really throughout the pandemic, uh, demand has been really strong, particularly for physical goods. And uh, partly with the inflation on prices, but very much also volume uh, that has really put demands on the sy logistics system and led to shortages of containers and over freight capacity. So that has taken us to this situation where uh, yeah, many are struggling to get the right deliveries. A contributing factor to that is also uh, e-commerce that when that has being very rapidly adapt, adopted much more across the world. That puts a strain on the logistics systems. And you have to use the trucks and logistics facilities in a different way uh, to do all these deliveries to consumers. And that takes up a lot of capacity that makes it more expensive and harder to uh, uh, freight the goods uh, earlier on in the supply chain. So um, what this boils down to is that we come in a situation where we started at freight rates being somewhere around $1,500 per container from China to North Europe back in 2020 to then during 2021 really going through the roof over $10,000 per container. And then this situation has improved a bit during late 2021 and then now pretty much stuck at these high levels. And there, of course, it doesn't help with uh, the war in Ukraine, with, um, which means that air freight capacity uh, reduces and becomes more expensive. And also that a lot of companies who used to send via rail throughout Russia aren't really doing that anymore. It doesn't really work. So that capacity falls away on the margin while we still have really high demand. Um, other overall challenges for uh, imports from China is, of course, as we mentioned, the overall competitiveness of China, where China has increased productivity, but also increased salaries a lot uh, in local purchasing power. Then looking at the exchange rate, it's a very, very different situation uh, that has been an upward trend uh, for the Chinese renminbi versus the Swedish currency uh, throughout these years, hitting new highs now with overall global instability and uh, um, really a mega trend of uh, Chinese currency becoming stronger and stronger. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Manwen about what can we do. Okay, thank you, Johan. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, so Yuan has given an overall picture of what's happening in China and a lot of challenges. I mean, according to our survey, that basically uh, nine, over 93 percent of companies has a lot of challenges in sourcing and supply during the last 12 months. So in this uh, dynamic environment, what we can do in order to uh, minimize the risk 
the first of all, we, uh, it's very good to enhance the communication with the suppliers. So we know uh, what the production looks like, what the delivery process looks like, and we also need to talk to the right person at the right level to get the right information. Now, of course, we need to also diversify supplier bases. And uh, that means, I mean, we don't put all the eggs in one basket. We, we maybe need to look into suppliers from different regions. Uh, but of course, that means also maybe an increase of cost, more complicated in the logistic. It's a kind of trade off that uh, uh, you need to choose. Then it's also beneficial to do the uh, uh, scenario analysis. Uh, because the environment is changing so fast, everything possible, impossible, that could be happen. So we look at the different scenarios, what could be the best situation, what could be the worst, what could be the expected. So we know what's the consequence and uh, what's the new uh, opportunities and uh, challenges and uh, maybe pre proactively to do something about it. Now, also about the risk management process. I mean, many companies may, might have a process before, uh, but as we said, it's changing so fast uh, since the COVID. Uh, we are kind of living a new era and how to we develop a new risk management process according to the new environment. Uh, some of best practice to share to avoid the very uh, mistake and so we can cooperate globally and work very effectively. Uh, first of all, to understand the business risk that we are facing, uh, the strength the management and the supervision. Uh, the third, conduct scenario planning. And the first, the quantified risk impact and the likelihood in the forecasting. This we will elaborate a little bit more, so we know how to do it and uh, how to, in order to minimize the risk. Uh, now, of course, we, we need to make the strategic trade-offs. If we look at this from sourcing and the supply points of view, I mean, you're always looking after maybe to have the best quality, lead time and the price and the flexibility, uh, but in the reality, it's Usually, it's not possible to combine all this. So, we, we need to pr prioritize and make the trade offs. Then, last but not the least, the enhanced cross culture understanding. Uh, this could be quite tricky. I mean, I think many of us we have been living in different cultures, even we can the language and live in the environment. But still, I mean, it always comes surprise how we. Fundamentally, we have diff different way of interpret things. So here uh, uh, we will elaborate a little bit more about what we mentioned before: how to quantify, quantify risk and the in, in, risk impact and the likelihood in forecast. So here we have a matrix uh, with two factors. One factor is impact from high to low. The other factor is likelihood. So dep depending on the uh, likelihood, likelihood and impact, so we can classify risk in high, middle and low three levels. So then, in, then we can do two kind of analysis, uh, quantitative analysis and uh, quantitative analysis. So here we give an example of impact likelihood matrix in practice. Uh, for example, we have identified that there might be three risks in a future operation. And we give a, also, also a figure of for the uh, impact of each risk. Uh, so we say risk, risk two ha might have best, uh, the largest impact up to $100 million, and the risk three is very, very low. Uh, but the likelihood is, is different. The biggest the risk, too, has very low possibility to happen. Uh, and the risk one has very high possibility to, to happen. Then we times the impact with the likelihood, and we get the expected value uh, of the risk when it might happen. So here we get on the 
uh, right side, we, we get an expected value of a risk strategy. Uh, so we added up all this expected value of risk one, two, three. So say you, we have a forecasted uh, revenue of 100, uh, but take into all this risk into consideration, consideration and we'll get value of 69. Uh, then we look at the, the other scenario, that's worst case scenario. Uh, in this scenario, then we, we only look at the impact of the risk. Uh, we don't consider the likelihood. Uh, so in this case, uh, we get a totally different value. Uh, that's minus, uh, sorry, mm, minus here. So why, why do we do this prototype? practice. So this allows company to evaluate all these risks and develop the necessary data for the risk mitigation. Uh, now we also need to realize, I mean, less risks, but it's not possible that uh, we, we do everything to pre prevent because everything comes with a price. So it's also essential looked into the different scenario so we understand what's the worst could be happen. Uh, now let's we look into in China uh, health care uh, section. What's happening there? Uh, if we look at this the health care industrial market size from 2000 to now 2020, so it's almost 14 times uh, the, the market size. And in the coming 10 years, and it's forecast to be more than doubled. Uh, to put that in a percent of GDP, so we say uh, 2010 is around 4.8% of GDP, uh, the healthcare expenditure. And uh, 2020 is up to 7, and uh, 2030 it will be up to 16. Uh, 16, that's a little bit, uh, uh, the figure is similar what uh, we have here in Europe. Uh, in USA it's much higher, but uh, it's up to 20 or something. But that's because of a lot of maybe uh, OWA, um, how to say, all this insurance policy. So you get uh, more than necessary healthcare expenditure, maybe not the best uh, effective way either. The Chinese State Council, they have issued a Healthy China 2013 plan. So they will be focused on six areas. Uh, first is uh, smart healthcare uh, focus. And uh, as you were mentioned about, I mean, China is putting a lot of uh, uh, focus on building up 5G and other ICT infrastructure. Why, why do that? One of the reasons is because the China today Already, it's a lot of shortage in uh, healthcare resources. Uh, if we look at the uh, population, uh, like 1,000 people per doctor and the nurses, it's very low compared with uh, uh, Western countries. And those resources, you, it might not be possible that you can build up overnight. It takes time. Uh, so one. Uh, solution to that is, of course, that how to raise your so resources more effectively. So let uh, let's call uh, that they are uh, emphasize on smart smart healthcare. I mean, today we can see many patients in China they need to travel to other cities. Usually, it's big cities, especially Beijing, is famous for uh, healthcare resources, and uh, there's also a lot of famous doctors. Uh, in their free time, they fly to different smaller cities um, uh, to, to cure patients. And uh, by building up this uh, smart healthcare system, uh, it could be much more efficient to use the already very limited resources. Uh, the second focus is the third party healthcare service provider. Uh, many years ago, uh, the healthcare basically is all public in China, uh, but due because of this shortage of resources, uh, there's more and more private actors in this segment, uh, especially in the healthcare uh, uh, service aspect. Uh, body examination uh, for us uh, who like 
live here, like we say, I mean, China, at least I think they have been doing quite good. There's a lot of the, how to say, uh, preventive uh, examination has been done regu regularly. Uh, when I worked at uh, Ericsson China, I remember every year all employees, no matter how old or young you are, uh, we get the body examination. Uh, so maybe that could be also one reason that uh, to to do more preventive than uh, put a more uh, pressure on the limited resources. And uh, here in Sweden, as I say, it's quite li well, very little pre preventive unless you pay by yourself. Uh, the first focus is uh, maternal and the baby care. Uh, Yes, of course, it's always uh, the most the easiest money to earn. That's from the mother and the baby. The next is medical tourism. Uh, here we are going to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, what does what does it mean? Uh, this last is uh, Chinese uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, that's part of culture. Mm. Uh, and I know even uh, here Karolinska Institute has some cooperation with China in this aspect. Yeah, uh, in China, there's an island in the south part of China called Hainan. Uh, that's the only tropical island uh, in China. Uh, so for Chinese people, it's like, uh, uh, for, like a Spania for Swedish people. Uh, because north of China is uh, even colder than here. So uh, Chinese government ha has made Hainan as a pilot free trade zone uh, since 2018. Uh, and uh, this that means there's a lot of favorable policies. And in Hainan, there will be focus on three industries, uh, tourism, and uh, what means for healthcare, and that's medical tourism and uh, modern service uh, for healthcare, that's healthcare service and the high-tech industry. And of course, the life science is classified as high-tech industry. Uh, as healthcare is one of focused uh, industry in Hainan, so the government has a, a strategy and also policy to encourage investment uh, and other uh, cooperation in this area. So from last year, they published their strategy uh, uh, that's to build up, up other care service in this uh, island. Uh, that's because as said, as this only tropic island is very popular already for the old people to retire there. Uh, and also it's encouraged the usage of new technology layer, and they also has done some um, policies to facil facilitate uh, the use of new technologies and uh, new e medical equipment or drugs layer. Um, yeah. So they're opening this, this, we can see in this area, the policy in general is more generous, so it opens up the uh, more cooperation that might cannot be done in the mainland China otherwise. So in this area, Hainan will be focused on, uh, in healthcare area, they are focused on four areas. Uh, elder care, as we said, uh, health insurance, uh, just as you mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, changes in the banking insurance industry in China recent years. Uh, I know, I know, like I have a friend who was first employee in a insurance company, I think it's one or two years ago, already uh, she has recruited 300 people. So this opening up uh, gives a lot of new opportunities for the foreign uh, uh, insur health, health insurance company, which they couldn't have done uh, before the policy opens up. And then smart healthcare, as we mentioned, and uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And still about this <laughs> island, then there's a, a, a special area called Bao Hope City. And for this 
for this part of, uh, they have made it as an international medical tourism zoom. So they encourage uh, the, the, the new medic, uh, the medical service, uh, house management, medical care and the rehabilitation, as well as medical cosmetic and anti-age service. Uh, so what that does mean uh, in practice for, for Swedish healthcare company, that means you can launch your service or product without getting a full approval from the government. Uh, it's kind of fast track because usually we know uh, for medical device, uh, it takes one year usually to get the approval from uh, Chinese FDA and for the pharmaceuticals, it could take even longer time. So, so now in this uh, uh, Boa city, so it'd be very easy, uh, much faster for the foreign companies to launch their product and the service without getting a full approval. Uh, but of course, it's not just that you go there and launch your uh, service or products. There's some restrictions. And one of them is that uh, the foreign company need to cooperate with uh, one of four first healthcare institute layer. Um, yeah, so if we look at from statistic, uh, this tourism has grown uh, to over 80,000 people in 2020. Uh, I think the figure could be much larger now because of, you know, COVID. Many people, they don't travel as they used to do. Uh, here uh, I will give you a few examples and uh, what Swedish company has done in in China and uh, how we have helped them to improve their performance. Uh, the first is a medical equipment company uh, that uh, uh, produce uh, catheters. Uh, they, they, they are in certain operations ac uh, across the world. And uh, we, we helped them to look into the legal framework for the import requirement for this uh, uh, end uh, market. And we also did a supply base analysis. So have a short list of potential suppliers that uh, fulfill that requirement. And we also developed an implementation roadmap for the sourcing of this component. Mm -hmm. So the result uh, becomes the client has successfully implemented this uh, uh, execution plan and uh, so the landed cost of products has been reduced uh, 17 percent. Uh, the other Swedish company that they have been leading in uh, ele electrical wheelchairs uh, for more than 14 years, and it's a global leader in this area. And uh, because of increasing competition, they need to look into their cost. Uh, this actually, I, I could say, it's uh, uh, for this kind of products, especially, uh, it's quite you know big. Uh, usually, the cost uh, in Sweden to make it is much higher. Uh, to to make it in China. Uh, I have done one case before that we looked into. Basically, you can cut down the cost to the one third, but of course it's different from different products. Uh, so, I mean, some, I know some Swedish company um, in this area, you know, this uh, large size product. Uh, it's very good products, but since they they are a little bit uh, careful to relocate uh, production to China, uh, so the price usually is quite high. That actually is one bottleneck for the uh, market engine and uh, development, even even in Europe. Uh, but this company they realize this uh, and uh, also did the uh, did the necessary uh, to look into their uh, cost structure and set up a local sourcing uh, office there. Uh, so we have them to recruit it and train the local people and also 
uh, you know, for a lot of uh, companies, maybe they just need a few persons. And it's very a good solution that uh, set up a virtual sourcing office. Uh, that means the, the, that they are hosted, for example, by us or other companies to do this salary insurance management. So they don't need to set up a legal entity uh, for a few personals. That's more cost effective and the fast way to do it. Um, I also would like to mention also uh, one case of uh, a Swedish superfood supplement uh, producer. Uh, as you also mentioned previously, uh, this healthy food uh, industry is uh, booming in China. Uh, the middle class, they want to pay premium to buy the quality products. And this Swedish uh, company also see the opportunity in China. Uh, so what we did first, of course, we, we uh, look at the market engine strategy. Uh, we look at uh, market size. What's the target segment? Should it be target? Yeah, of course, usually a Nordic company, you target at the high end or middle end uh, market. And how to establish a brand. I mean, for this uh, B2C products, uh, brand position, that's one of the most important uh, things, how to uh, get this branding because it's less thousands of products in the market from Australia, that's very popular in China as well, America and Europe. And what's the partner? We did the partner evaluation and uh, how to do the supply chain distribution, the uh, physical, the logistic chain. Uh, so we also looked, of course, we need to look into the, uh, what's the regulation for import healthy nutrition food. Uh, and also this, uh, I have done case a few years ago in this area. Uh, actually, in this area, they also has make the regulation much more easier uh, for the foreign company to step into, mm. especially if it's only on the online sales. Uh, then the regulation is much faster. If you want to sell in the physical shops, it might take a little bit more, longer time for the, all these approvals. Uh, then this, in this case, is in commerce, so building up website and the social media. And uh, one thing they did is, of course, is also to sign the EU Wagner uh, as the brand ambas ambassador. ambassador. Uh, I mean, in China, maybe we all know here, I mean, people maybe mix up Sweden and uh, Switzerland, but uh, people all know EU Wagner, that's more famous than Sweden. Uh, so, so what's the result is that there's millions of uh, traffic lead to this uh, company's website, and now they're well established in China and is continue its marketing expansion work. Then this Geo Wadner uh, branding is also a very successful move. Um, how can we help you? Uh, we are focused on four areas. Uh, first is market engine and expansion. Um, when you want to enter a market, uh, it's a we all usually start with a uh, just strategy overview. You know, how big is the market? Uh, what's the competitor looks like? Uh, how how to uh, enter this? I mean, that's a different way to enter a market. Uh, we can do direct sales. Or we can go through some agent or distributors, or we can have our own representatives. And all this, uh, which way to choose? Uh, it depends on the company, you know, what's the resources. Uh, it, it depends on what's the character of your uh, product and the service. Uh, for example, if your service is quite complicated and uh, need uh, expertise, need support, in that case, then it's very good. You have a maybe own uh, personal own place to do that. 
because usually when you use the agent or distributor, uh, they are doing hundreds of products and they all, always put focus on the, the products that they earn most money, uh, most money with. Uh, I have seen cases that the companies uh, that uh, pay their distributor, so less than one people sit in the distributor, but uh, folks on their products. That could be one solution as well. Yeah, so so now also it's also we need to say if you use agent distributor, uh, less also a, a risk because you have different interest. Uh, a conflict of interest. So it's always good, uh, just like we review the cost every year, we review the distributor, we review the market landscape. If anything happens or if the opportunity, you know, gets better, maybe we should make next step. Oh, yeah. So usually, I mean, in many cases, we see when you use distributor agent, you get some sales, uh, but quite often it's, um, it's not, nothing dramatic. Uh, uh, yeah, so you, if real, you think China or South Asia is a big market potential, maybe it's sometimes it's, you, you need to look from time to time uh, to see what's the next step. And uh, sourcing supply chain management, uh, this we have been talked a lot uh, since there's so much challenges last 12 months and still, uh, and uh, how we manage uh, how can we minimize the risk? So here, I mean, what we can help out, of course, we can identify uh, potential suppliers and uh, evaluate your current suppliers if the cost is still com competitive and uh, take some cost reduction initiatives. And we can also look the into country region analysis and assessment. Uh, as we said, uh, uh, to also to, so it, if you totally rely on one supplier or one region and gets shut down, uh, it will be very catastrophic result. Uh, we can provide sales sourcing trainings and uh, then we also help with uh, reconstruction and transformation. Uh, and then last, of course, the finance and the merger acquisition. Uh, you always need money to do business. Uh, if you see Asia is one of your most important market, maybe it could be something to consider to find an investor from the region uh, that not only bring in money, but also bring their competence and the networks uh, to find a value added local investors to finance the local operation. So that could be something to think about. Uh, we also see, um, yeah, there's companies, Nordic companies that are make more investment in China. Uh, then it's very important to do the due diligence, how the company looks like, and uh, uh, also as you mentioned, now nowadays the, the, the system, you know, company information get more and more transparency, uh, but still. Uh, it's not as transparency as here. And also Chinese that um, accounting system, it's a little bit different from here. Uh, so it's very important to, to do this due diligence work with the local competence. So you know, you pay what you, yeah, you know what you pay for. They, of course, also less companies moving out from China, a divest uh, because of the, the competition or whatever. So that's something we can help out as well. Uh, here's a list of some com companies we have been working with. Uh, so from large companies like Sandvik, Atlas Copco, Permobile, it's a life science company, SCA, all this. Uh, but of course, we also work with a lot of uh, growth company and startups as well. And uh, many of them actually has been uh, working with us for many years. Uh, we have three business models here. 
Uh, first is like the normal. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Manwen, I think we need to, uh, I think we have just like five minutes left. So if you can wrap okay. up, then we'll have some time for questions. I know okay. there is one at least. I'll wrap up in one minute. Sorry. Yeah. So first is normal uh, lo uh, normal advisory. Then the second is more as business partner uh, that we work as a uh, instead of establish on sourcing or sales office, we help you with that. Why do we do that? Of course, it's faster, it's cheaper, and it's more efficient as the team or the person get access to the resources uh, of the rest of organization. Now also for the startups and growth companies, uh, what we can do, we can do a turnkey solution in Asia, uh, and the, the reimbursement is mainly based on the milestones. So if we reach a goal, then we get reimbursed yeah, by different ways. So that's all uh, we are going to talk about today. And I'm in Stockholm, you is in Beijing. We'll be more than glad to, if you have questions, so feel free to contact us. Thanks. Great, thank you. So everyone uh, prepare your questions and we, we will start with the first one from Min. Um, uh, and I actually had that same question as well. So if you have, if you have started operations and, and sales in uh, Hainan and you have the approval for Hainan, is it possible to then use it for the rest of China or do you need to go through the regu regular regulatory process for other places in China? So yeah. far you need to. So China, Hainan is just like a fast track you can test. And for mm. Chinese government, they get also the data and um, it could make, make it easier as it has been used on the patient. So they have some data, but still you need to go through the uh, regular process. OK, so it could perhaps count as uh, uh, as trials. It's a device, yeah, mm. but still. Is any shorted, shorten the time approval process? Yeah. Short it could shorten the, yeah, the, time, the pr could approval be. process for yeah it could be uh, because you get some data already mm -hmm. that's good yeah do you have a successful case for this uh yeah hi now we don't have yeah we don't have mm -hmm. thanks so how long has hainan been in in uh, in real operations because i was there in 2019 mm -hmm. And then yeah, it was just even I mean, if even if it had been uh, decided and officially opened maybe a year earlier, it felt like it was still starting up. Yes, it is. I mean, I think it will take a long time because I mean, to develop a, a region, you need competence and all this. So far, Haina has been seen as a tourist city. Uh, mm -hmm. So so I think it will take time, but it, the, the tendency is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many people, I, I know people that usually maybe they need to go abroad, you know, because there's some foreign ch treatment or medicine that's not available in China, but they, they travel abroad to get that treatment. But nowadays, uh, if that company has been to Hainan, it's much cheaper and faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I have one more question? Because if other people have yes, no. go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, Man Wen, you talk about the insurance. It's uh, it's also the focus area in the healthcare. So any, I mean, the foreign insurance and the company can cover the uh, this area, elderly care or other area. Insurance, which company? Yeah, healthcare insurance. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, yeah, it's opening up. So, so still, I mean, there are regulations, but uh, it's much easier to first uh, to to set up operation and also the, the, the you know the range which, which kind of service you can provide it. Before it was very limited. Basically, you can only have a rep office, but they, now they can do a lot of uh, transactions. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to saying, I said, if a Swedish, uh, I mean, the investor to do the you know, Swedish hospital or elderly care and any insurance, I mean, can cover, you know, in China, in most uh -huh, of the, yeah, uh, yeah. 
most of the people, you know, to go to the hospital or whatever, it's uh, it's partially yes, free. Find yeah, that to get yeah. treatment. Now, yeah. actually, now I don't know. I know, like like Chinese people, if they have health insurance in other province, yeah, in Hainan, they can get uh, reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's but yeah. uh, Sweden, China, I don't know actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because this is very key, yeah, if paid by individual, it's huge money. So that's mm -hmm. why if the insurance com can cover that part, it might. But be I think a lot the of policy is mainly. I think a little, a little, a little, what they thought is more for Chinese is to go abroad to get uh -huh. the treatment. They can go to Hainan. Uh -huh. So that's the starting point for this policy. Mm -hmm. Because there are quite a lot of Chinese that they, they get treatment in USA and other countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So now it's actually 10 o'clock. I have one more question, um, maybe for you one. Uh, but if uh, people need to, to leave, uh, please do. Um, and if you have any more questions, maybe the rest of us can just stay for a couple of minutes. But my question was, you, you mentioned, Yuan, that um, uh, online education, that sector was almost wiped out overnight. What happened and what, uh, I mean, that could also have been something that would have uh, blossomed after the pandemic, but it went the other way around, if I understood it. Why is that? Mm. Yeah, so this was very much to uh, the context of uh, China, in particular Chinese middle class, having these uh, burdens where one of these is paying for educational expenses, where kids are spending lots and lots of time uh, uh, in extracurricular classes and parents spending on that. So it was really a political direction that uh, you want to limit that and you also want to have the control over what is taught and uh, the curriculum in the education system. So, of course, there is still online education, but quite a lot of that uh, that is very connected to what you study in a normal school, uh, that was regulated to the point where many companies just disappeared or uh, cut down very much uh, in what had been a booming sector. So, is it only for, for children's education or is it, for example, for a continuous education and training of... Uh... Employees. No, this, uh, this was really focused on uh, kids' education. Okay. I see. So, do we have any other questions? If not, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Johan and Manuel a lot for your quite comprehensive overview and um, yeah, a lot of useful information and things to keep in mind when doing business in China. So thank you for that. And um, as I said before, don't forget to to register for our next um, webinar in uh, on the 20th of April. And the next one will be later on in um, in May, probably. So keep your eyes open for that. OK, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.